So what is a building energy management system? I hear you cry. Probably if I could hear you crying, you'd be shouting to someone to put a kettle on. But let's assume you've shouted, what is a building energy management system? Um, just to go back and explain how we got to where we were with building energy management systems, there's always been a need for control. Uh, and the first commercial thermostats were actually invented way back in the 19th century. In the late 1800s, um, uh, Mr. Johnson, Warren Johnson, invented the first commercial thermostat, went on to create the moderately successful uh, Johnson Controls Company, uh, which I believe is still about today. Don't hear much from them. Obviously, they're huge, but they actually invented the thermostat. Um, the, uh, later on in the 19th century, we started to get pneumatic control systems. So we started to get analog control, and that remained the mainstay of control systems right up until the 1970s. In the 1970s, we started to see discrete uh, electronic control systems because electronics were starting to become cheaper. And by the 1980s, this was uh, the, the norm. Uh, when I first started work, which is around about the, the mid 80s, there were a huge amount of um, Stafer controllers, particularly out there. If you look at, at that picture on the far right hand side, that's a, a Stafer controller. I think that's an RDK99 controller. Um, it turned out that this discrete uh, system was, was actually a, a blip in the development of uh, building control because uh, once we had these discrete devices, that is devices which provide one function, uh, people realized that it would be much more useful if you could share information between the controllers. The process control industry had been doing this for quite some time. Um, sharing information between devices uh, and obviously that transitions quite well to controlling buildings. Now, just to explain the difference between a networkable controller and a standalone, that RDK99 there performs one function and one function alone. An RDK99 has two proportional outputs to control. Typically, it would be valves. And that was all it did. You couldn't get it to do anything else. If you wanted to switch a fan on, you'd need a different controller. If you wanted to add integral control to that, it doesn't matter what integral control is, but if you wanted to add it, you would need a different controller. Um, and it would not share its information with anything else. It was quite typical. You would uh, go to a building. If it was a small scale installation, you might find three or four outside air temperature sensors upstairs on the roof because three different processes needed those outside air temperatures. So once we had networkable controllers, we could share information and using the outside air temperature example, we would have one outside air temperature sensor, which would collect all the information would be collected by one controller, and that would then be distributed across the network. So that's a very simple example of why networking controllers became so important. Um, the controllers evolved. <coughs> Um, and by the 90s, uh, direct digital control, DDC, had become the normal method for deploying control solutions. Uh, when I first started doing this, these were the orange boxes, the trend boxes that you see down there were, were very commonplace. Um, they were quite complicated to set up. It was um, highly specialized and not every building had a building management system in it. Um, it was something which was slowly being adopted, but it wasn't the commodity item that we see today. Um, we've moved on a pace. Uh, lately, um, you will find a phrase, IOT, the Internet of Things, which is a phrase that I really hate because it's like they couldn't think of a name for it. It's, what do we call this? The Internet of, I don't know, things. Yeah, brilliant name, Dave. Let's call it that. Um, so we now see this IoT technology and the difference between IoT technology and standard BEMS technology is the idea that the um, intelligence, the control is down at the field level and it can communicate directly with the internet rather than needing to communicate to a gateway controller. Devices can publish their information direct to, to the web and be used by other devices. Now, this course doesn't dwell on IoT technology. There's, there's tons of stuff out there on that. But it's the, the latest development of where we're seeing things uh, moving in our industry. So the benefit of a BEMS, why would you put one in your building? You've got a building. First thing, as we've already established, is you need a 
uh, complex system in order to provide comfortable conditions. And you need to do it in an energy efficient manner, manner. One of the things I always say when I'm on my courses, saving energy is really, really easy. If you don't believe me, wait till December, turn all the lights off and the heating in your house. I guarantee you 100% you will save energy. However, you're not going to be very comfortable. So this is the purpose of a BEMS. We need to provide those comfort conditions, but we need to do it in the most energy efficient manner possible. Um, if we have a network solution, we can obviously share data throughout the building. Uh, now that we have very fast communications uh, using our BEMS, we can actually share lots of information. We can look at the position of every single valve in a building and establish what the demand is for the boilers or the chillers. So we can uh, use those network solutions to create some quite uh, complicated strategies. Um, and the system can be extended. So we can incorporate control uh, and monitoring interactions uh, with other services. Um, particularly one interaction we see a lot is lighting solutions. If you walk into a room, it might have a sensor to turn the light on as you walk into the room. You can feed that sensor information into the BEMS to have an effect on the heating or the cooling in the room as well. Another benefit of BEMS is the ability to log historical data. Uh, for a long time, we've been doing this uh, and looking at the trends. Often this was by printing uh, graphs out and, and looking at them and we could see where we were getting highs and lows historically. Um, more recently, we've started seeing that historical trending data being fed into very large databases which are crunched um, at cloud level uh, by very powerful servers to actually try and assess um, what is happening with your building, why you're getting peaks, troughs, and to identify items of plant that might be causing a problem without the human interaction. This is, a, this is a, an AI, for want of a better word, um, kind of interaction. <coughs> um, the other function of BEMS uh, is users can be alerted to out of condition events in the form of plant alarms. So uh, if, for example, you have a room which has a temperature set point of 22 degrees C, you would probably want to know if it goes up to 24 degrees C, something is wrong there. So the temperature exceeds the high limit threshold and we send an alert. Now, if you have a head end, and we will be looking a little bit at, at, about head ends later on, uh, that would probably pop up on your head end and it would be logged in your head end. But it doesn't have to be uh, in that form. You could send uh, an SMS, a text message to someone to tell them that there's a problem, or you could send an email out to alert someone uh, of a problem. So these are the benefits of having a BEM system. Uh, particularly, these are the benefits that we didn't get from having discrete control systems. More than just control, uh, as I've already alluded to, uh, we now see data analytics as a, a huge industry. Uh, more powerful hardware provides the scope for additional functionality. Uh, certainly there are people out there now, they are trying to gather enough information about their buildings that they can actually analyze the data and make real-time adjustments to their system based on the analytical data. Um, controllers themselves are so powerful these days that you can actually provide uh, some um, rudimentary uh, data analytics into the processes themselves. Uh, right at the beginning, I had a picture of an e EasyIO FS32 controller. That has a quad-core processor in it. Uh, when I think back, and I, I don't know, I'm obviously <laughs> quite old, but um, it's about six times more powerful than the first desktop computer that I actually had. Uh, so we can actually use that to, to process our information at, at, at the controller level. Um, BEMS data uh, can also be fed into other systems. And this, this is not a new feature, but it's, it's something that we're starting to see because of the interactions that we've got with BEMS. Um, it can be used to determine proactive PPM tasks. PPM is planned preventative maintenance. And typically you would have a schedule. You must check this pump once every three months or whatever. These are the items to check on it. Uh, 
with BEMS monitoring that pump, maybe we don't need to do it every three months. Maybe we can actually use that analytical data to say, well, actually the, the PPM, this pump is running fine. There's no problems with it. Uh, and we can extend that so we can actually make better use of our time in terms of planned preventative maintenance. And of course, um, all that helps to not only reduce our energy costs, but to reduce our facilities management costs as well.